I'm super glad to be here. My talk's title is As Easy As Rails, which is hopefully confusing because I'm going to explain. My name is uh, Justin Searles. Uh, I, uh, uh, thank you, Kobe. I come from a company called Test Double. We're a consultancy in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we are, uh, we're here to make friends, basically. We, we, we're, we know a lot of great developers in the Midwest, uh, and we've been traveling uh, to conferences in Europe and around the country and this is my first time ever really to Southern California. So I'm really, really glad to be here. I'd love to meet you today. Uh, if I don't get the chance to meet you today, I'd really appreciate it if you could uh, uh, send me feedback on Twitter or send us an email to say hello. Uh, we're just looking to get to know people in the area. Um, this is a talk about three of my favorite things. One is cupcakes. Uh, the second is the planet Earth. Uh, I'm not sure if you're a fan. And third is monolithic application architecture. So say that you own a bakery. Um, at the bakery, uh, a customer comes to you and says he wants something sweet. So you cook him up a cupcake. And he says, you know, I, on second thought, I want it a little bit sweeter, maybe a little extra crunch. So you put some sprinkles on top for him. And then the customer says, you know, I'm sorry to do this, but on third thought, I'd really love it if it was filled with hot fruit filling. And then you're like, ah, god damn it. Because you realize that cupcake was the totally like the wrong abstraction, right? What the, what the customer really wants is a fresh, hot baked pie. And it's an honest mistake. You know, that, that happens. But if this was part of your workflow as a baker, every time a customer came in to immediately assume that they needed a cupcake, uh, only to have to throw away the cupcake and bake them something else, that would be a problem. So suppose you own a software studio, and a customer comes to you and says, hey, I need a web application. So you immediately start Rails new. And then they say, well, you know, that graph looks really nice, but I need uh, some zoom and some filter and some more dynamic behavior. And so you're like, well, all right, I can, I can manage. So you sprinkle some JavaScript on top. And then he's like, you know, I really need this to feel a lot more like a native app. I want, I, I want all these other advanced interactive features. And you're like, ah, god damn it. <laughs> what they really need is a fat client JavaScript application. And to the extent that there is Rails, it's off to the side, and it's really just providing JSON services. In fact, it doesn't necessarily need to be Rails at all. Honest mistake. But of the software studios that I hang out with, I run into a lot of people for whom that seems like their regular workflow. And I'm here to address that problem today. The reason I think it keeps coming up specifically to the Rails studios that I talk to uh, is that Rails makes life too easy. Um, because when I'm, when I'm operating in a Rails context, I have all these amazing server-side tools. So much stuff is within reach and so convenient. And when I talk to Rails developers about their favorite client-side tools, Usually, like they come up empty, right? They mostly like like no one hates JavaScript more than Ruby developers. <laughs> and of course, just kidding. It's not like there are no client side tools. That's hyperbole. It's an exaggeration. They exist. Uh, uh, they're just terrible and rusty, and require a tetanus shot first. So. There's a value proposition that we make in our heads whenever, whenever a new application or a new feature comes to us where uh, we decide what the best technological approach is. And there's two big things that factor into that. One is, uh, what's the best implementation for this application, just, just considering only, only what the app needs to do? And then the second uh, aspect is, uh, what would be easiest for me to implement it in? And because Rails is so easy, I think that too many of us try to solve problems on the server side in the Ruby community that really would be better solved in the browser. Uh, and so, so because that's out of balance, I, I see a lot of Ruby uh, devs in particular uh, favor Rails a little bit too much. So I have a provocative statement to make, which is that non-Rubyists are building better JavaScript apps. Uh, uh, in some of my travels this year for Test Double, talking uh, at conferences, I went to my first .NET only conference in Sofia, Bulgaria this year. And I'm, I, I did not expect to have anything in common with anybody. But all these .NET developers have been building single page JavaScript applications for years. They, were all, they all knew Angular. They all knew the best node tooling. They were really hip and with it. And we, we were talking the same language, and it was awesome. And I didn't expect that because I typically assume, well, .NET's kind of crusty and whatever. And, but really, the reason is their server side isn't so awesome that they want to solve everything in it. 
So they're making honest judgments about where the best place to solve the problem is. But another way you could say, if you look back in your own career, before Rails was easy for me, JavaScript wasn't hard. I remember back before Rails that I actually wrote a decent amount of JavaScript. And it was only once I adopted Rails that, I, that, that it sort of tapered off. Now, of course, ask yourself, is JavaScript a terrible language? Yes, definitely. <laughs> but be careful not to conflate. Is that why writing JavaScript is terrible? I think we tend to assume that's so. But uh, uh, ask again later. At the end of this talk, ask yourself that. Because I'm not so sure. Because there's more to, to complexity than just a language. So uh, let's talk about planet Earth. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I love Ruby isn't just for the language, it's the community. I love all you guys. I don't even know you yet, but I love you. And it's because the Ruby community has changed the world in so many ways. If you look, if you were to chart all the great new tools for web application development over time, starting in 2005, you know, uh, gems start popping up uh, uh, 2006. As time goes on, more and more awesome web tools, best of breed tools for building web applications, not just Rails, but you know, Haml, SAS, all this other cool stuff was being born out of the Ruby community. And so if you wanted the best tooling, uh, you'd look to Ruby. But then I noticed like right in around the beginning of 2012, I started to notice something where a new browser feature would come up, come out for, for Chrome, say, and then a gem wouldn't immediately follow. It would be a, a, a node package. And, and, and in 2013, I became inundated with all the best new features of the web were being built primarily like, you know, in JavaScript first uh, uh, for Node in terms of the tooling that you'd use to implement this. And so when you think about 2014, I know a lot of Rubyists who fear that 2014, this, this, this cycle is going to go even further and JavaScript's going to eat planet Earth. And I can't speak to that, whether that's accurate. But Gary Bernhardt seems to think so. And let's talk about what makes the best tools. Where, like, if, if you're a new developer, uh, and uh, you're trying to figure out what the best tool to use is to build a website, there are certain facts that I think we could probably all agree to. First of all, Ruby's tool ecosystem is mature, but it's crowded. Um, Node's ecosystem, meanwhile, is immature, but it's very innovative. There's new stuff getting pushed to it every day. Um, uh, also, it's probably fair to say that tool authors are not immune to trends. They want to go where all the hordes of people are going so they can get usage. Um, uh, add to that that tools tend to address the problems of their day. So a tool, for example, built as a gem in 2008 that hasn't changed a whole lot probably is better serving the web of 2008 than the web of 2014. You add all that together, and I, I'd like to make the statement that Node's web application tooling tends to better solve today's problems, or at least today's problems as I run into it, which is a, a sad thing to say if you are convinced that you only want to write Ruby code all of the time. Let's talk about monolithic application architecture. Rails won the war of web application frameworks, right? I mean, before Rails, there was a whole lot of web application frameworks that fits and starts. But after Rails, everyone was trying to be Rails. They were stealing all these great ideas uh, uh, from Rails. But we often got so caught up in the meteoric rise of Rails that we didn't really ask ourselves, which war did Rails win? What type of web application is Rails best suited for? Because we kind of just tend to think of like uh, uh, all web apps being equal. DHH last year at RailsConf, in a great talk about Rails, uh, he, he had a quote saying, good frameworks are extractions, not inventions. So think about Rails as an extraction. What's Rails an extraction from? Well, Basecamp. Uh, the, the company Basecamp that makes Basecamp, they, they, they started with Basecamp and then they uh, extracted out the successful bits into something generally reusable, which of course became Ruby on Rails. And what sort of bits uh, uh, were those? Well, it had a really good URL routing scheme. Uh, it was good for modeling behavior and the relationships between those models. It was good for dealing with persistence, like uh, saving off to a database and managing a SQL query, uh, a SQL schema. Good session management for multi-page workflows, uh, mailers and other ancillary things, and then a range, a bevy of uh, uh, JavaScript alternatives, like Ajax ERB tags and RJS, and then later unobtrusive Ajax ERB tags, and most recently turbo links. All of these things to prevent us from actually writing real raw JavaScript in the client. And why is that? You know, a lot of people poo-poo all those solutions, but it's not that they're bad. It's not that they uh, uh, are inherently awful. It's that they solve a very specific type of problem 
from which they were extracted from Basecamp. It's just that they're not generally useful for a fat client JavaScript application because that's not what Rails is solving for. So Basecamp is like, you know, it's a traditional, it's a perfect example of like a document-driven application. You start at page one, you move to page, you click a thing, you move to page two, and then you click another thing, you move to page three. That's the type of application flow Rails was built for. And I call those HTML user interfaces. Now, if you're building a web application and HTML is your UI, it might look like this. Like you have an anchor tag, it's a link with a, uh, um, an href location and, a, and, a, and a, a content, obviously. But that's not really user interface programming, right? I'm not, I, I'm not responsible for any of the stuff that like, what happens when you click the link, right? The browser actually knows, okay, I go to this address. Or how to render the link. Similarly, like if I had a form, I'm describing like what the browser should do uh, you know, to post this form and what kind of stuff it should be collecting inside of that form. But I'm not doing all the event handling uh, uh, in the form itself. I'm not responsible for rendering and painting that onto the screen. What I call HTML user interfaces, they're a specification of a user interface. They're declarative. They're telling us what the user interface should be. But they're not doing behavioral, real like UI programming, especially if you've come from a background where uh, you're doing like desktop programming or native mobile application development. Totally different, right? The JavaScript UI are more similar to those, more event-driven, because you're responsible for all the behavior of the application. You want to render something into the page, you're going to need code to do it. Or if you want to handle a user event, you've got to bind to an event and then handle that in this example like asynchronously, right? Totally different. And so it would be bizarre for us to think that a single, a single framework, a single tool would be a great way to address both of those. Uh, and uh, if you look at just like directory layout, because I think of our projects, of our frameworks, they say a lot based on what the directory structure looks like. In traditional Rails, we have obviously we have controllers, we have models, we have views. Um, and now we don't ship Rails projects like that because we also usually need some JavaScript down in this ghetto right here under assets, JavaScript, <laughs> application JS. And you know, uh, uh, of course, all of the JavaScript we need should go into one file, which is probably true for like 75% of Rails applications. You get these big, gigantic, nasty balls of mud. Late recently, you know, like because that big nasty ball of mud is bad, I see a lot of Rails studios go to, you know, having uh, uh, this this sort of two-step of here's my MVC on the back end, here's my MVC a couple directories down for the front end. It's very duplicative, and it sort of doesn't make sense because uh, uh, progressive enhancement, as nice as it is, would would make it very difficult to manage two user interfaces simultaneously. So I'm seeing a lot of teams also look at that. Uh, traditional HTML UI and just get rid of it completely and start fresh from a fat client JavaScript application when that's what's best suited for the app. So you look at this now, and if you're a new developer, you know you have this JSON API on the back end and this JavaScript UI for the front end here in one project. What's that little line there? It's like a vestigial appendage. I say it's, I say it's vestigial because we can only explain why it's there in terms of the past. You know, we have to give somebody a forensic history of Rails or of web application development to explain why that's there. And what's wrong with that vestigial appendage? Well, um, uh, if you think about how your brain reasons about a small application, when it all fits in your head, you can get around everything really, really quickly, even if you've got the back end and the front end all in one place. But as the app grows, eventually every application, can, if it's successful, reaches a point where we can no longer fit it all in our heads all at once. And what happens like, you know, uh, 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 when that happens, it's just like an operating system. We can only fit part in the, our brain at once. We can work in one place. But then whenever we want to reach over for the other part, we have to page out. And if, if it's not a cohesive split, it means that I could make changes in one part of the app, and then I just have to kind of be afraid of, well, I wonder how through all the tangled objects and stuff, this is going to affect the other part of the app. And then I, thrashing occurs because I'm constantly context switching. But if on day one we'd split up into two applications, app one, app two, in a, in a cohesive, sensible way, as that grew to the same total net complexity, we could grow even bigger. And then the context switching is much more natural because app one is its own physical, discrete thing. And app two, when we want to page out, sure, we can't fit it all in our brain at once, but at least we're not thrashing and stomping all over ourselves. I, the changes that we make are more likely to be safe. I like to use the phrase, late extraction costs more than early abstraction. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine you have two balls of yarn. If you have two balls of yarn, in fact, and I, I experimented I, I, before this talk, tried it out, it turns out it's very easy to take those two balls of yarn and make one big nasty tangle of yarn. 
But if you have one big nasty tangle of yarn, it's very, very difficult to figure out how to make two neatly, perfectly constructed balls of yarn out of that. That takes a lot more effort. So if you've ever seen this in a modern fat client JavaScript application that was written in Rails, uh, so you have the JSON API in the back and then you have front end uh, uh, pure API driven JavaScript awesomeness. But if you see something like this in your layout, like uh, global JavaScript variables that are basically data dumps of information from the server, what that really means is that your yarn is tangled. Because you might think you have two applications living in one directory, but you could not extricate those two at all sensibly. In fact, even if it's only three or four things, I've lost weeks of time trying to figure out how to make life work without a token, because then there's all these deployment concerns and so forth. So late extraction costs more than early abstraction. Taking a monolith and breaking that in half is very, very challenging. So if we want to get away from monolithic applications, if we want to have JavaScript live as a first class thing, we have to make JavaScript easy. So I've spent the last uh, several years uh, uh, of my open source time focusing on how can I make JavaScript development easier. So it forces me to think like what really goes into application development uh, and, and productivity. Uh, uh, there's an application framework layer, which is like the models that we extend from, the libraries that we use. There's conventions and then default configurations that are handed to us by whatever you know, ecosystem we live in. And then there's like a build automation that's responsible for our, our you know, development server, our build stuff. And in Rails, the application framework is obviously that's Rails' job, active record, action pack. The conventions and configurations were also set forth by Rails. And then the build automation, it's rake, but it's really Railsy rake. There's the Rails CLI, and then there's also uh, a whole bunch of rake tasks, but they're all, you know, for the most part, shipped with Rails, uh, require a Rails environment. So Rails really owns the whole stack for most intents and purposes. And if I were to grade them, I'd say that as an app framework, Rails, over, initially I thought it was amazing, but over time, the amount of tangling between my models uh, uh, and the difficulty to, to practice TDD the way that I like to in Rails lends me to give a, a B minus just to the application framework part. But I think the conventions and configurations in Rails have always blown me away. I love the tribal knowledge that once you learn a little bit or hang out in the community, you learn all these awesome things, and then you can go to another Rails project and ramp up really quickly. Build automation, I think, is pretty good. I think Rails solves a lot of problems that you know, map to the 80-20 of how we work. But in particular, it's that convention and configuration that I look for when I'm working in another, in another ecosystem. And I'm usually disappointed. So talking about fat client JavaScript apps, you know, there's application frameworks like what I want to use seems to change every six months. Maybe it's Backbone in one, in one stretch, and then Ember, uh, and then Angular. And these slides are actually like a couple months old now, so I don't have React here yet. So, so I don't want to fix to the application framework and whatever my tooling is, because I'll just be disappointed and I'll have to throw away all the tooling. So I'm just like, whatever. I'm, I'm cool with whatever framework. Uh, I want to build conventions and configurations that are framework agnostic. Now, when it comes to the build automation piece, I really like Node.js because, like I said, really trendy, so there's lots of new stuff happening there, really fast because of, uh, it's just blazing fast for file I.O. Some of the benchmarking I've done is like 20, 30 times faster on the same Mac SSD doing basic file I.O. under Node than on Ruby. Insane. Um, Grunt in particular, we'll talk about Grunt a little bit. Grunt has a ton of community plugins that, that, that uh, make task management really easy. But what is this configuration layer? What's that going to be? Well, we built one. It's called Lineman. Uh, Lineman, uh, 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 like, as in like a lineman working on the railroad, uh, is got a Twitter address, Lineman.js, and then we have a documentation site, linemanjs.com. Uh, and we're going to show you a little bit of that now. Uh, to get started with Lineman, you just have to have Node.js installed, and then you can, from a new terminal, say npm install globally Lineman. It'll give you a binary you can use, so you can create a new app saying Lineman new. And it looks a little something like this. So here I'm typing Lineman new my app, and I get some cool ASCII art as well as some sample commands to start running. So I'll CD into that project. And then once I'm there, I'll tree out just the files that I get, because they say so much about what, what we expect. So here I've got you know, application CSS, images, JavaScript, pages, client-side templates. I've got a handful of configuration files. Comes with a lot of uh, tests already pre-configured, test helpers, and then some uh, you know, place to put vendor files, like vendor JavaScript, jQuery, so forth. So let's talk about why Lyman makes life more convenient for us. Well, 
what I seek in a workflow is, you know, I want to be able to write some code. I want to be able to save that code, have it compile if necessary. I like to write coffee scripts, so there's a compilation step. Concatenate everything just like it would be in production. And I want to be able to play with that code all in less than 100 milliseconds. Really, really fast feedback. In Lyman, that looks like this. I start Lyman's dev server with Lyman run. That's up and running. It's watching all my file changes. I can see the initial page here by going to it. I'm going to change this method to say goodbye world instead, suicidal hello world program. Refresh the page, and then it's already updated. So, so working in Lyman, even at scale with hundreds of files, really, really snappy, which is something we were looking for. But it's not just about uh, uh, exploratory testing your app and command R driven development. It's really important that it have a really good TDD story, too, because I often test drive. And so we ship Lyman with a tool called Testum by Toby Ho. Uh, it's a fantastic test runner. I've written lots of test runners, and I like this one so much more that I've more or less let all of mine fall into disrepair. If you use Jasmine Rails, I apologize, because I don't maintain it as well as I should. So this is what the test, uh, uh, test story looks like. I'm going to tab over into a second shell and run Lineman spec, which runs an interactive test runner. And I can bind as many things as, uh, to it as I like here. It's running in Chrome. I'm going to go over to uh, test, and now I'm going to uh, uh, test first, change the expectation of that method to goodbye world, save the file, see the tests are all instantly failing, and then update it, save the file, and then all my tests are passing. Again, really, really fast, even in large projects, but you'll just have to trust me for that. I can go and uh, quit out of the interactive runner and then run in a CI mode, spec-ci. It'll do a full build of my project and then run the tests against that. Um, and exit in how you'd like with a reportable format. And every Lyman project ships with a Travis YAML file already pre-configured. So if you push to GitHub and you just click OK on Travis, you have CI for your front-end project. The deploy story is really easy, too. Uh, if your server can host static files, because Lineman is laser focused on just building front-end web assets, uh, you can host it any which way you like. Um, uh, you just do a Lineman build, and then you figure out for yourself how you want to deploy it. Uh, when you run Lineman build, uh, which is the, 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 the build command for, for distribution, and then tree out the disk directory, uh, out of the box, it's not a lot, right? It's a single concatenated CSS file, minified, a single concatenated JavaScript file, minified, uh, and an index.html file that, that pulls those two in. Uh, eminently understandable. We also have a single, uh, like a, a Boolean flag in the configuration you can set, and you'll get asset fingerprinting so that it's uh, CDN friendly for delivery. We also have a, a custom Heroku build pack so that you can, just with a one line configuration, push to Heroku, have Heroku build everything for you right away. It's very convenient. It builds with Node.js, but then on your dyno, it actually runs under Apache. So, so you don't have Node running in production, which means you can scale up quite a bit more uh, uh, on just a single free dyno. We offer a bunch of starter projects. Uh, like, for instance, if you're just looking to get started with Angular, once you learn a basic vanilla Lyman project, you can, you can find your way around all these starter projects really easily because of the conventions. So we have example uh, Angular project, Backbone, Ember. Uh, we have actually projects just for building uh, standalone web libraries to be published, uh, not, not, not full applications. Uh, and also we have one for Markdown blogs. All of Testable's websites uh, are, are using this Lyman blog template so to, to publish lots of static files. Uh, Lyman is also very easy to extend. Uh, because Grunt provides the uh, tasks, we'll talk about Grunt, uh, we just have to build this kind of thin candy shell around these tasks that kind of tell you where these tasks fit into your project. And from a user's perspective, once we've built this plugin once, all you have to do is say npm install, and then this will save that to your project uh, and uh, uh, add it to your package.json so you can track your dependencies. And the name of this one is Lineman Bower. So if you want to use Bower for your third-party vendor uh, dependency management, you just run this once, then you say Lineman Run, and then it's built in already. It's running as part of the task at the right part in your build, and you don't have to do anything at all. You have your Bower JSON file, and you can just specify whatever you want. So zooming out, I've mentioned Grunt a couple of times. When you look at the world of all of these JavaScript tools, Lots of them are being packaged as NPM modules and then paired with a grunt module that lets you uh, automate the tasks associated with it. Last night, for example, uh, I found, yeah, if anyone's familiar with the Doge meme, I found a Doge script uh, NPM module and a grunt Doge script, of course, already existed. So I published a lineman Doge script lineman plug plugin, and it only took about you know, 15, 20 minutes to put together. Grunt is fantastic. It's a really good 
build tool. It's, you know, descendant inherits a lot of ideas from make and rake and everything else. Uh, it's really good in particular at separating uh, task configuration from task behavior. So it's really easy to build up a config and then let the tasks just run in a way that I haven't found in a lot of other build tools. And there's a lot of them because they're so easy to publish because the API is so simple. So lots and lots of grunt plugins to uh, pick from. Uh, uh, and it's easy to write your own too. I've written several and the API is just super easy. Revisiting the concept of monolithic application architecture. If you're going to break up your, your monolithic app into two, uh, you, you know, you have a client side project and a server side project. Maybe they live in so separate repos. Maybe they're subdirectories under one repo. It doesn't really matter. But how at runtime in development are you going to be productive? Because it's not like you're going to run a full deploy and then, you know, see them deployed. So Lyman solves this with a pro, uh, uh, feature that we call uh, API proxying. Basically, you have your development browser. Uh, you point to, uh, like, let's say we have Lineman and a Sinatra app. You point to port 8000, uh, which is the Lineman application. Lineman will forward any API requests you make to, say, Sinatra. Sinatra will respond to Lineman, and then Lineman will phone home back to you. This looks a little something like this. So, like, I've got this application here. I'm going to comment out our default configuration to enable API proxying. Set the port to 4567, which is what Sinatra likes. Looking at my application, I've just, uh, it just reads in a slash high uh, uh, from the server, prints that onto the page. Now the server, written in Sinatra, has a slash high route. It just returns I heart Ruby. So if I run Lineman, it'll have API proxying now enabled. Uh, you can see I already have Sinatra turned on. And if we refresh 8000, Sinatra got the request from port 8000, printed out, uh, returned iHeartRuby, and then that printed out to the page. It makes uh, this physical separation of code possible, but still feels seamless during development. There's another case, though, that's important to cover, which is that uh, uh, sometimes the server doesn't exist yet. Like, like, the whole benefit of breaking up a monolithic app into two is that development doesn't have to move in lockstep anymore. We can build the client first without the server and just sort of specify the server uh, later. Or we can just work ahead a little bit. Or maybe we're working on a new client side feature and uh, the server route for that route needs to change a little bit, but we don't want to kind of you know, worry about that yet because we're still trying to get feedback about whether or not we want to demand those changes of the API. In that case, we have a feature called API stubbing. In this case, you know, your browser would uh, talk to Lineman. Lineman would pretend it's calling uh, off to the, uh, the API, but instead stub it back and then respond back to the browser. Everything is invisible to you, as, uh, you know, as, a, as a user in your development environment. And that looks a little something like this. So we can take the exact same route we just did and kind of overwrite it locally in Lineman. So we'll say uh, the Lineman ships with this express application. All I'm filling out here is a little response handler to uh, send back the string I heart node even more. Inaccurate statement. Run Lineman here. So that's just still running, but now when I refresh it, Lyman's going to catch that first because it's higher in the, uh, in the middlewares. So uh, a fantastic way to work really quickly. We've had a cl entire clients that have asked us only to work on the client side system and tell them what they need of the server side later. And this actually works out to be a really fantastic little like spec sheet because we can just play with things in memory and be really lightweight. Another, another thing that I love about breaking up monolithic applications is I had an experience once where the first time I was doing this, experimenting this, with this a few years ago, at a 30 minute test build. Now, obviously there's slower test builds out there, but it was longer than I thought it needed to be. When I broke things up for separate reasons into two applications, I was really curious to see how my test rewrites would go. And what I found was that writing the tests for just the UI first, the tests were way more clear. Uh, I was able to focus on just the UI concerns, not the whole application. And I was surprised to see that the whole front end suite of tests, in, uh, UI integration tests, were only four minutes of runtime out of that original 30. So then I expected, well, the problem must have been in the back end. But then I saw that the back end tests of just you know, testing it as a web service also were, were really, really clear and really nice to write. And that was also four minutes. So then I thought, well, clearly I'm missing something, so I should write some smoke test around this just to make sure that it all works. And I tested several paths through the system. And that only took a couple of minutes in this case, because I wasn't exhaustively testing every case. So now I went from a 30-minute test build to a 10-minute test build, even the amount, though the amount of net code had increased by then because I split the app into two. That was really, really impressive. And it, also, I find that it's just habit forming generally, because there's some one-time problems that you have to solve, right? Like, how do I deal with versioning of two things? And how do I handle deployment? Um, but once you solve it once, uh, you can easily apply you know, a third service to your mix, 
or get in the habit of building like you know maybe uh, another front end, maybe a native mobile application that talks back to now your very pure, true JSON API from from your server side. And so lately, the number of GitHub repos that I that I'm responsible for have skyrocketed, and I've got a whole new problem. Also today, I'd like to announce, uh, since we're here today, and I'm, I'm excited to share with you that we've published a Rails-specific plugin for working with Lineman and making it totally seamless. It's called Rails Lineman. It's a gem out in Ruby Gems, and a Lineman plugin to go with it called Lineman Rails. And when you install it to both of the projects, they can work totally seamlessly. And so during your assets precompile step, your Lineman assets will just kind of magically get grafted onto your Rails app. Uh, works in Dev and Prod really easily. To learn more about that, if you go to linemanjs.com/rails.html, uh, uh, we have a very cool little site designed by Derek Briggs. Uh, uh, at Neo that, that drew up the, the instructions and make it really, really obvious to get started. So um, I'd like to thank, too, uh, uh, for this talk. My friend Marissa Heil did all the, uh, all the good illustrations in the talk. Uh, I, I had to make my way with the other ones. Uh, she's a terrific visual designer, and she's available for contract. Um, and once again, my name is Justin Searles. Uh, Please, I'd love it if you, if you tweeted some feedback to me uh, at Searles on Twitter, or uh, you know, you got some critical feedback, you can send it to our, our, our email inbox, hello at testdouble. And I'll also be tweeting a link to the slide deck uh, from my account as, as, as soon as I sit back down. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.